Hello, this is your state senator, Len Suzio. Uh, this is part of our continuing series of videos on people who are uh, doing wonderful things in our community. And today I'm in Middletown at the state police headquarters visiting uh, Colonel Battle, who was just appointed uh, as the head of the state police. And I think this is gonna be a great interview. I've always been interested in what the state police do. Colonel Battle lives in Senate District 13 in Cheshire and we're going to talk about how he got to where he is today, and we'll talk a lot, too, about what the state police in Connecticut do. Colonel Battle, thank you for participating in today's program. Oh, good morning. Thank you for having me. Great. Well, let's talk, first of all, a little bit about you. You've just become appointed as uh, uh, the head of the state police. So what does your job entail now in, uh, as the uh, head of state police? Sure. Um, so uh, first, it's, it's an honor to have the opportunity to serve as the Colonel of the State Police. Um, I'm in my 31st year here with uh, the, the State Police, an agency that I'm very passionate about. Um, the Colonel's job uh, really is about um, creating partnerships and working collaboratively with local PDs, our federal partners, and, and uh, the various components that make up the State Police. So, um, the state police is divided really into three major offices. Field operations, which uh, most of the public would see on a daily basis that cover patrol operations and traffic enforcement and accident investigation. Um, administrative services that are kind of the behind the scenes um, regulatory component of the state police and um, uh, some of our other uh, specialized units, the fleet operations, facilities, and um, crimes analysis, things of that sort, kind of the support function behind the, the field operations. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we have um, professional standards and, and training, which is our uh, recruitment and selections, the training academy, um, internal affairs, and our accreditation. So another uh, support aspect of the state police, but those three major components um, make the, the, the state police um, run on a daily basis and, and all of those components working together help us serve the community. Now, you've been, as you mentioned, 31 years with the state police. Did you, did you serve time in all those units or uh, where, was, where was your experience uh, focused? Um, I, I've been blessed and had the opportunity to serve in many different areas of, of the state police. Uh, certainly, I've not served in every unit, but I have. Uh, we all start in, in patrol operations, and I've uh, served as a, a trooper and a supervisor and a troop commander. Um, and I also worked in professional standards uh, in internal affairs and inspections and accreditation. Um, and I spent a lot of my time in administrative services just prior to this assignment. I was the commanding officer of administrative services, um, more on, on, the, on the business side of the agency, if you will, regarding um, capital uh, infrastructure improvements, mm -hmm. equipment acquisitions, regulatory services, all of those functions. So I have touched each area of the state police, which I feel is really beneficial in, in transitioning into this assignment. Yeah, because now you're the head of the whole Megillah, basically, and you've, if you've had experience in, in the different units, I'm certain that helps you understand what their issues and problems are and, and how to lead them. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And by the way, I just want to call to the attention of the audience. I mean, I thought, well, here's the chief administrator. He's got a desk job, but you've got a sidearm with you. You're ready for action, it looks like, Colonel. Sure, and, and all of uh, our sworn members, regardless of, of rank, are also out in the public on a daily basis. Uh, oftentimes conducting motor vehicle stops or assisting disabled motorists or um, responding to critical incidents. So we all share in those roles and responsibilities even though on a, on a daily basis we have individual tasks to, to mm -hmm. accomplish. And, and mine is a little bit more of a global oversight in, in uh, the day-to-day uh, operations in conjunction with all three of those primary segments of the agency. Um, and and looking to the future and planning for the future uh, of the state police, but mm -hmm. um, we're really fortunate. We um, we have a great team of people uh, of all ranks, and, and it's really about uh, a thousand people working together. Truly, both sworn and our civilian staff um, making making the agency what it is. 
thousand people. That's quite a few people, and yet you're still understaffed. I think you mentioned to me your, your normal staffing might be in a ballpark of 1,200 or so. Right, our, our normal sworn staffing is about uh, 1,200, so we have an academy class in currently that will be graduating uh, later in the summer. That's a rather small class, currently um, 26 people in, in that class. And then we anticipate um, a class going in in the early fall of about 100 people. And, and that will probably have to occur a couple of times to compensate for current shortages that we have mm -hmm. and, and attrition and retirements that would be up, upcoming. Um, and then we have about uh, four or 500 civilian positions in addition to the 1,200 sworn positions. So mm -hmm. collectively, um, the, the state police is you know, pretty robust with personnel that um, address all of our areas of responsibility to, to help make Connecticut a safer place. Mm -hmm. That's interesting, the civilian position, so that'd be things like receptionists and secretaries, or would there be lab technicians, or who else would be included in the, the right. civilian position? So lab technicians are, they're a separate division, the Division of Scientific Services, so they're not truly part of the state police, they're part of the overall uh, umbrella of the Department of Emergency Services and Public Protection, which is comprised of six divisions, one of which is the state police. On, on the um, civilian side of the state police in particular, some of uh, the, the clerical support personnel, um, we have office assistants and processing technicians that do a litany of um, assignments in, in um, more on the regulatory side of processing criminal history background checks and providing reports to the public from incidents that the troopers investigate, and we have some analysts in our intelligence uh, area. So a, a wide array of, of positions that support the, the overall mission of the state police and, and work in collaboration with our, our sworn personnel. Mm -hmm. Now tell the audience a little bit uh, how you got to be the top dog, so to speak. Uh, was, it, was there a committee that selected you? Was it the commissioner? Uh, is it a political appointment? What, how did you get to where you are now? The, um, the, the colonel of the state police also serves as the deputy commissioner, one of the deputy commissioners in the agency. There are two. And, um, you know, I've had the opportunity to work in every rank in the state police with the exception of master sergeant. Um, and ultimately, it's the commissioner's decision on appointing the colonel. Um, and I was, you know, fortunate. I, I've had the opportunity to. Um, work with the commissioner as, as a, a captain and a major and a lieutenant colonel and ultimately um, uh, she, she felt that I had the skill set and uh, the qualifications to be the colonel and, and uh, I was fortunate to be appointed by, the, by Commissioner Schreier. So maybe again, I'm, I'm still learning just as I listen to you about how the, the state police are structured. So you report to the commissioner and who is the commissioner? Dora Schrero is, is the commissioner, and I, I report directly to, to her. And how do you work together? What, what distinguishes your responsibilities from her responsibilities, for example? Uh, the commissioner is, is responsible for the, the agency in its entirety, again, which is comprised of six divisions um, that cover a litany of, of uh, public safety responsibilities. So. The other five divisions are the Division of Scientific Services, or the Forensic Laboratory, mm -hmm. the uh, Police Officer uh, Standards and Training Council, the Municipal Police Academy, um, Fire Prevention and Control, um, which is the Fire Academy in Windsor Locks and, and, the, and different fire schools around the state, um, Statewide Emergency Telecommunications, um, which is our 911 and our radio, microwave radio infrastructure throughout the state, and, uh, and, and then the, the, the state police. Mm -hmm. So I, I believe that's six divisions. Um, One, two, three, four, five. Okay, you got it. <laughs> uh, and, uh, um, and, and then, so the commissioner's responsibility is much more global of mm -hmm. overseeing all of those entities, and there's there's um, a deputy commissioner or a director that oversees each of those divisions, and then the state police, um, again, which, which I have the opportunity to, to oversee. So my role, if you will, is a bit more, uh, is restricted to one division. We all work together on, on, there's crossover, and we all work together on a multitude of 
of common issues, again, whether it's um, uh, filling positions or acquiring, uh, making infrastructure changes. We, we co-locate some of our operations on different properties throughout the state. Uh, so the divisions do work together and, and we all meet regularly, regularly to understand um, the, the, the needs of each of the divisions and um, it's more of a collaboration. So mm -hmm. it's, it's not a competitive type of thing. It's, it's a, really a collaboration and sharing of resources. Mm -hmm. The, and again, the, so the commissioner coordinates all of that, all of those six divisions, mm -hmm. and my focus is um, solely on the state police, mm -hmm. which is one of the larger divisions, but again, um, it, those six components need mm -hmm. to work in, in sync to, to make the agency succeed. Now, when a crime happens, how do you interact with local police and who has what authority and what responsibilities and what types of crimes would you might have you might have um, priority in versus uh, the local police if you could explain to the audience to the audience how law enforcement uh, authorities work together right uh, in, in Connecticut of the 169 towns um, the state police is responsible for law enforcement coverage for 79 of those towns Wow in more of the, the rural, rural smaller mm. communities. The other um, cities and towns have their own established police department. And um, so oftentimes they will handle the, the daily operations and crimes and accidents and all of those calls for service within their communities. Sometimes we will get called in um, a couple of ways. Either the, the chief of police will call us in for an assistance um, for maybe an area of expertise that that they may not have, whether it's our fire investigators or our major crime personnel, our bomb technicians, some of those specialties mm -hmm. that a smaller agency may not have. Um, and sometimes the, the state's attorney, depending on the incident, may request the state police to come in to um, be involved in some of those more complex mm -hmm. crimes. So, and then in the other 79 towns, we we're, as the primary law enforcement uh, entity covering those towns, um, we're, we're first responders and um, uh, de detectives and investigators that all provide the same level of service that you might see in Meriden or Middletown mm -hmm. or one of the other larger communities throughout the state. Yeah, I remember reading your story in the local newspaper when you were promoted and it uh among other things, it said that when you were a little boy, you used to go around with your father, and you remember seeing the state police right. on the highways. Uh, how big um, responsibility is traffic enforcement as opposed to law, I mean, you know, crime enforcement, let's call it that. Uh, is that a very big part of state police responsibilities? Or in, in what roads are you on, just strictly the state roads, the highways, or, or what? Right, well, we have responsibility for, for all, of, all of the highways in, in Connecticut, um, where there's a a state road that might tra traverse a local community, we, we don't necessarily have responsibility on, on those roads. Mm -hmm. um, but highway um, safety is one of our primary objectives um, and ensuring that, that citizens and visitors alike to the state of Connecticut um, uh, have a, a, a safe experience in throughout the state. So um, highway enforcement and um, accident investigation is one of our primary functions. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I know, so I, of course, traveling up to the Capitol all the time, and so I'm coming up I-91, and we're, you're located just off of I-91 here in the northern part of Middletown, and uh, uh, I, I've watched some crazy driving going on. And I'm saying, sometimes I'm saying to myself, where is the state police, you know, because I've seen people go blowing by me uh, at 90, 100 miles an hour, and they're zigzagging in like crazy maniacs. Uh, uh, and it, it, does that become, you know, I know that you do investigations when there are accidents on the, on the state highway and that kind of a thing, but uh, um, how do you determine what roads get surveilled and, you know, and, and, uh, and you don't have to reveal secrets, of course, but just give us an idea of, 
uh, how you determine where you're going to put uh, units on our state highways to observe traffic infractions and things like that. Right. Some of it is based on um, accidents, mm -hmm. and 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 we monitor the statistics of where accidents frequently occur, and then deploy our resources there. Uh, sometimes it's on. Uh, based on input from the community if there's a, a chronic problem in an area. But we, we try to, um, you know, monitor the activity um, statewide in general and make sure that all of our patrols are always covered. Um, and then we'll deploy our traffic uh, services unit to supplement our patrol operations in, in different highway mm -hmm. enforcement initiatives. And, and we also uh, work closely with the DOT in, um, in different funding opportunities and different safety initiatives, whether it's um, DUI enforcement or seatbelt safety or aggressive driving campaigns. So we're, we're constantly monitoring that and, and different driver behaviors. Certainly we encourage voluntary compliance. Mm -hmm. um, but we are out there and we also have our, our aviation assets out there at different times as well. Fixed wing aircraft and our helicopter also um, patrolling at different times. So we're, we are monitoring the traffic and whether it's um, commercial vehicle enforcement on the parkway where they shouldn't be or it's aggressive driving and speeding um, on any of our and any of our roadways and then at different times of the year when when we know driving behavior varies for different reasons we have the Memorial Day holiday right. coming up um, and so we'll we'll have increased patrol um, enforcement out on those holidays Memorial mm -hmm. Day Fourth of July New Year's a, a multitude of holidays when we see um, an increase in, in, in traffic and um, sometimes uh, some impatience on some driver's behalf <laughs> that uh, <laughs> uh, you know perhaps some corrective action might uh, a little aggressive behavior maybe or <laughs> right right so but our main objective is to ensure highway mm -hmm. safety yeah. and and when we're taking proactive enforcement initiatives that's to prevent tragedies from occurring right. and and serious or fatal motor vehicle accidents from occurring right. that's really our main objective how many aircraft do you have, fixed wing and, and helicopters? Well, we have three fixed wing aircraft uh -huh. and uh, two helicopters. Okay. Um, and now you would never transport somebody who's injured. You're just transporting your own personnel to a site or you're observing, I guess, using like right. the helicopter. Aerial surveillance. Yeah, yeah. Right. Li Lifestar is um, for the, the helicopter yeah. for, for transporting injured persons and things of that. Right, so. right. Now, you've been 31 years doing this. I'm certain you've had some interesting experiences along the way. Maybe you could share a couple of those experiences. For example, uh, what might have been the one, one or two of the most dangerous situations you found yourself in in these 31 years of service to the people of Connecticut? Um, I, I, I think some, um, well, nothing is routine, I will say <laughs> that. So, so from different motor vehicle stops, um, you know, I can recall back that, um, you know, you never know what's going to occur when, mm -hmm. when, you, when you stop certain motor vehicles. So um, there's been some experiences with, with that. And um, if we have like a hostage or barricaded person situation, some of those more volatile situations mm -hmm. without getting in, into the specifics, of course. But, mm -hmm. but uh, non nonetheless, those are um, some experiences that, mm -hmm. that uh, you're confronted with. Um, and, and, and require some different mm -hmm. strategies to, to mitigate those. Again, we're always looking to resolve some of those stressful incidents with a peaceful outcome. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you know, we use a multitude of resources mm -hmm. to resolve those in that fashion. Well, you know, it always amazes me, uh, as a civilian, you kind of take uh, safety for granted, uh, but as a law enforcement official, I'm certain you've seen situations where safety becomes a real issue. Even when you pull over a car, you walk up to a car, you don't know for sure whether that window opens there's going to be a gun pointed at you or what, right? I imagine, uh, I mean, I can't imagine uh, walking up to a car that's been, let's say you, you've pulled over for uh, some wild driving and you have no idea whether that driver's under the influence of some kind of drugs and may, may shoot you indiscriminately. Uh, uh, it's got to be a little stressful to say the least, I would think. Right. 
Well, I, I, I really credit our academy staff with um, providing very robust training to, um, to ensure that our personnel are, are prepared for those different situations. They're, they're very dynamic. There's a lot going on on the highway with the speed of the vehicles, with um, the vehicle that you might have stopped that you're trying to deal with. So there's, there's a lot going on, but um, I think our, our academy <coughs> staff is, is some of the finest that I've ever seen. Um, mm -hmm. I think that they prepare our, our personnel uh, adequately from the initial recruit training in the academy and mm -hmm. in-service training throughout each of our careers. Mm -hmm. and did you, in all these 31 years you've been doing this, have you ever had a situation where you came away saying, wow, that was really awesome, like, uh, you know, where you were real happy about the outcome and the way it turned out? Uh, maybe you delivered a baby or something? I don't know. What, yeah. uh, tell us a, about um, some of the happier experiences you've had as a police officer as a state police oh, officer. Oh, sure. I, I, I have never delivered a baby. Uh, <laughs> well, you got to get you ready for that. <laughs> but um, I, I, I think, I think uh, but I have had the opportunity to um, have a positive impact mm -hmm. on, on, on a lot of different people. Mm -hmm. And it could be something as simple as, um, you know, just assisting a disabled motorist with, um, you know, maybe a young driver or an elderly driver who is um, just, um, concerned about being on the side of the highway and they're scared and you provide some level of comfort or someone that's involved in a motor vehicle accident and again you just to be there to to reassure them so mm -hmm. those are you know some of the rewarding things that that stand out um, and and even you know um, motor vehicle stops when someone might be you know getting an infraction or um, I think when you treat people fairly and, and with respect and dignity, they understand the job that you're doing and, and the main objective is to, to make the, the highway a safer place. Um, and even many of those interactions are positive at the end of the day. Now, you're at the top of the, the, the heap here at, at State Police. Uh, tell the audience a little bit about where you are today and what your plans are for the future. If you can envision what the State Police might look like 10, 10 12 years from now, what changes would you see going on? What do you have planned for the uh, agency? Right, um, I think a lot of our main objectives, the, the, the core mission, if you will, remains the same with um, providing you know, highway safety and conducting criminal investigations. Um, certainly, uh, again, the, the, the societal demands are, are very fast and, and we live in a fast-paced world, um, ensuring that our personnel are as equipped as um, possible from uh, from the day-to-day -day equipment that they need to specialized equipment to keep up with different emerging trends, um, and 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 we're confronted with some some new um, things that we had not been confronted with in the past. So, for example, we just uh, um, formulated a cybercrime investigations unit, mm -hmm. and. Um, that's, that's something that, you know, as recent as two years ago, we, we didn't have. It's been in the making for a little while, um, but I'm happy to say that that's up and running. And um, uh, we provide assistance uh, to local uh, police departments that, that need those services. Uh, our own agency investigations, we're, we're part of a task force with our federal partners on that as well. So that's a very emerging area that we're, we're transitioning into. Um, we're, uh, we're, we have some new technologies that are integrated in, into all of, with all of our troopers in their day-to-day -day operations from uh, in, in the vehicle now. We have in-car computers and in-car cameras, um, uh, electronic citation machines, um, license plate readers, and we're transitioning into body-worn cameras that all of our uh, personnel will be outfitted okay. with. So there's, the future I think integrates a lot more technology into the day-to-day -day operations that we have um, than we've ever seen mm -hmm. in the past, mm -hmm. so. Now, how has the opioid crisis affected you, or has it affected the state police at all? Um, uh, yes, un un unfortunately, that's a, a situation that, um, knows no boundaries and, and, and people from all, all walks of life and all backgrounds and all communities are um, impacted by that and, and, we, and we see that as well. Not 
only in the rural communities that, again, you know, we serve um, as the primary law enforcement entity, but, um, you know, we, we, we see people um, under the influence of opioids mm -hmm. on our highways as well. So, mm -hmm. um, ag again, that's um, uh, hopefully something that as a society at, at large that we're able to deal with, but it does have an impact on our personnel. We have all of our um, personnel in the last couple of years have been trained and, and uh, equipped with Narcan to I was going to ask about that. Yeah. Uh, assist in, in <clears throat> overdose situations. So so yes, it, it has mm -hmm. um, changed how we how we do business and different situations that we're uh, that we see on uh, unfortunately almost a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean I know as a state senator I've learned a lot more about it. And one issue I've become familiar with too is sex trafficking in minors in particular. Have you gotten involved in any crimes of that nature? Or you uh, have you collaborated with like the FBI or any any other law enforcement agencies regarding sex trafficking and juveniles? We we do have folks involved on uh, different uh, task forces to address those issues as well. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, again, that that it, it it crosses state lines and 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 town borders, and so there is uh, that's a mm -hmm. collaborative effort with our our. Uh, mm -hmm. local and, and federal partners in, in some of our investigative units and, uh, and we see some of that transition over into uh, the, the cyber environment as well. So our, yeah. our computer crime uh, personnel um, are engaged in that as well. Yeah, that's, I, I mean I learned by going to a couple of seminars on this that that's how a lot of young women and girls are, are kind of captured initially. They, you know, they, they hook up on the internet and then they meet somewhere and uh, the next thing you know, they're they're caught in this uh, web of uh, uh, where they're, they're they're providing sexual services, and it's it's really I was shocked by what I learned, Colonel, and I and it's it's growing uh, at an explosive rate, uh, according to the FBI folks I met with too. Right, right. Um, so our uh, so our personnel are are dedicated to that as much as any any other um, criminal behavior, mm -hmm. and again, it's. It's uh, being cognizant of different emerging trends um, in in the communities that we serve, and allocating our resources appropriately to to address or mitigate all of those various issues. We're down to the last minute or two of our interview. I want to make certain that you get the opportunity to say anything you want to say to the audience. Is there a message or anything you'd like to convey to the audience about the state police uh, and what you do uh, before we are done with this interview? Um, I, I think the um, well, first and foremost, it's it's an uh, honor and a privilege to serve as the colonel of the state police, and um, we have a long history of 115 years of of uh, quality, uh, dedicated people serving the citizens of the state of Connecticut, and that mission continues today. Um, that we we take very seriously. Our main concern is is public safety, and whether it's in your local community or it's on our state highways. Uh, we're here to serve the, the people of the state of Connecticut. Um, um, I, I, I couldn't be prouder of the, the folks that, that do the job day in and day out. Um, not only our state police personnel, but, but police officers across our state and across our nation um, that are committed to, to serving people and, and making our communities uh, safer and a better place to, to live and raise your family. I want to say that uh, I deeply appreciate this, the service that the men and women in blue render to our, our citizens. Uh, we all too often take it for granted. You put your lives on the line. Even something as simple as a traffic violation, you never know you're going to pull a, open a, see a window open up and a gun pointed at you. And uh, you have my respect and my appreciation. I personally want to thank you for all your service to thank the you. state and the people of Connecticut. And now you're uh, in this great role to lead the, the state police. Congratulations and thank you for appearing on today's uh, interview. Yeah, thank you very much and uh, thank you for your support. Okay. Well, I hope that you enjoyed this interview today. Again, Colonel Battle is one of the great people of Senate District 13 that's rendering valuable service to our citizens. And I, I wanted to call him to your attention. Uh, thank you for tuning in to today's show, and we will have more coming as well. This is your State Senator Len Suzio thank, saying thank you for the honor of representing you in Hartford and meeting great people like Colonel Battle.